So investing in yourself is the best thing you can do. Anything that improves your own talents, nobody can tax it or take it away from you. So that's so that's a good thing to know because you can take your subject matter expertise, like for example, your subject matter expertise in biotech can be used for investing in companies like Pfizer, Moderna, and others. And you can use that subject matter knowledge in like vaccinations, other medicine, et cetera, to, to apply that to figuring out which company has a competitive advantage in that market. So it's a very valuable skill set you have for healthcare and finding out which companies will outperform in the healthcare sector. So as far as I'm concerned, the stock market doesn't exist. It is there only as a reference to see if anybody is offering to do anything foolish. So Warren Buffett, he he doesn't follow the stock market. He looks at businesses. So he doesn't track the day-to-day -day price movements of companies. He just looks at how the business is doing from their operations and management. So that's all you should focus on when you're an investor. Just look at how the company's doing in their operations and management. Don't look at the price. And yeah, so don't look at where the price is today or tomorrow or the next day or the next week or next month. Just look at how the company's operations are going, their management and their finances. So the wisdom of Warren Buffett, all we need, all we want is to be in businesses that we understand, run by people whom we like and price attractively relative to the future prospects. I buy businesses, not stocks, businesses I would be willing to own forever. Invest within your circle of competence. It's not how big the circle is that counts. It's how well you've defined the parameters. When management with an excellent reputation meets a business with a poor reputation is usually the business reputation that remains intact. So you want to look at stocks as businesses. That's very important. And also invest in your subject matter expertise. So biotechnology, look at healthcare. Healthcare would be ideal with that. So anything in science would be a very good very good circle of industry for your expertise. So this passage here, it goes through a lot of what most people do in the market. So I'll ask the class here, can you read this and tell me what you learned from this? So yeah, so read this for a few minutes and then tell me what you've learned from this passage here. Is it just that every day the market changes and that it's up to you to pick certain like days that are worth investing on? Yes. Yeah. That's, that's a good, yeah, that, that, that's a good, uh, yeah, that, that, that's a good answer. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks Curtis. Yes. So it goes through how the prices change all the time in the market and it's best to just, ignore the prices and just figure out when prices are cheap like figure out what time the price is at the lowest and then buy and then once you buy just don't listen to the noise in the market so that that's that's very important there sometimes the price changes don't have meaning much meaning behind the fluctuations yes so a lot of it's random short term 
Exactly. So there's no there's no real meaning to the price changes. A lot of it has to do with confidence, like people panicking, people having fear of missing out. So a lot of the reason why prices go down is because they people are panicking. And also a lot of the reason why prices go up is because people have the fear of missing out. So price goes down, panic, price goes up, fear of missing out. And there's no real logic behind it. It's just human emotion. They're just trading an emotion. So yeah, very good, very good uh, analysis of that, everyone. So good news, the market is dropping. So you want to invest in a great company when the price is cheap. So for example, for example, Pfizer is a great company and buying it cheap would be a good opportunity. So investing in something that the market doesn't like right now is is a good thing. If if the company is great, it doesn't matter if you're going to buy it at a high price or a low price. It's the same company. It's kind of like buying something on discount. If if you're buying something from the grocery store on discount, it's still the same product. Like if you like pizza, it's still the same product regardless of if it's priced high or low. It's still the same product. You still get the same amount of value out of pizza if it's priced at $2 or $10. You still get the same amount of value. It's just different price. So it's not like the pr it's not like the value change when it goes to two bucks. So that's something you got to think about with investing. It doesn't matter where the price is, the value stays the same. Recognize the majority of investors play the short-term investment game. So most investors, they buy because they fear of missing out sell because they're panic selling. So that's the majority of investors while this strategy that Warren Buffett outlines is the edge. So you have a competitive advantage over others by applying the strategy. People sell on bad news. They panic because of bad news. Sometimes the news is justified. So if the company is falling apart, that is justification for selling. But if you find out the news is not going to lead to the company falling apart, then don't sell. So yeah, kind of uh, take the news case by case. Companies that have a franchise product and thus a competitive advantage have the economic power to weather most bad news storms. So having a competitive advantage is really key because you're going to be able to win against your competition. And the competitive advantage is the most important thing. One of the most important things. So you can, you can go ahead of your competition and get more customers. Always invest in companies with a long-term durable competitive advantage, which we call a franchise product. Product characterized by fewer or no substitutes, product in demand by many, little or no government regulation. So can you think of companies with a long-term durable competitive advantage with little competition, high demands, and not that much government regulation. Yeah, Sony could be one. What's Sony's uh, competitive advantage, Christabel? Okay, yeah, that could be it, yeah. So that could be a potential option, yes. Any other examples anyone can think of? Um, Coca-Cola? Yes, Coca-Cola is a great example. Yes, so that's the one that Warren Buffett loves. The it's it's a great example because it's really a duopoly. The Pepsi and Coca-Cola own almost all the market for that, and there's very small other like other producers are very small, and they 
they have an edge. They have an edge of the competition in terms of brand, taste, and a lot of, yeah, brand, taste, com- the distribution strategy, et cetera. And there's not a lot of substitutes outside of them. It's a very in demand. And yeah, they, they probably will be, they've been successful for the last few decades and probably for the next few decades too. So yeah, Sony hardware software movies. Yes. Excellent examples. So any other examples you can think of? There's many out there. Yeah. Just think about brands that you use every day. Procter and Gamble. Like they have a lot of competition, but their stuff's probably the most well known. Yes, Serena. Yes. Procter and Gamble is a great one. They have a lot of great brands, a lot of great products. And Warren Buffett, that's one of his favorite companies too. So that's a great, great answer. Microsoft, yes, Microsoft is a great one. Apple too. Yes, both of them are very have very durable competitive advantages and not a lot of substitutes. Like Microsoft and Apple, they both offer an operating system. There's not a lot of substitutes to it. And they offer a lot of their products, the software they provide, there's not a lot of substitutes in demand and government regulation is minimal. So great answers to that. Yeah, those are potentially great investments because they don't ha- they don't have a lot of competition and not having a lot of competition is good as an investor. If you want it, having as an investor, you want as little competition as possible because, because it makes it easier for you to price your products higher. So when you don't have a lot of competition, you can price your products a lot higher than if there was competition. So you can maximize profits because you don't have to worry about competitors driving down the price through competition. So that's that's very important. And you can have lower competition through having a a competitive advantage where you drive competitors out because your product is just so much better. So market volatility is your best friend. You wanna buy when it's low. Like I said, with the example, If it's a great company, it doesn't matter if it's a low price or high price, it's still the same company. So turn off the stock market. Remember that the stock market is manic depressive, wildly excited sometimes or unreasonably depressed. This behavior creates opportunities, but you do not allow the market to dictate your actions. Don't worry about the economy. Buy a business that has opportunity to profit in any economy. Buy a business on a stock. Change your perspective of that as a business owner and learn as much about the business and industry. Manage, so... That's very important. So you want to be looking at it as a business and don't look at the stock market. So some stuff here that I'll go through. So when interest rates rise, business becomes more difficult and vulnerable. This is due to the high cost of borrowing money to invest in the business. When interest rates decrease, it is easier to borrow capital and therefore expand capacity and activity. Hence, interest rates are the price of borrowing capital to the business. In finance 101, you should have already covered the before and after tax costs of borrowing capital. So the in that case, when you borrow, you want to have the lowest interest rate possible because you're going to make more profit because you're paying less in, in paying off debt. Your interest costs are lower, so you pay less in paying off debt. So your, your profits are going to be higher. So lower interest rates are good, are better for the stock market. So if you think that interest rates are going to go down, the ba- if you think the Bank of Canada is going to lower interest rates, then that might be a good opportunity to invest in stocks because stocks benefit from lower interest rates. Also, inflation is a big problem. So when inflation is, is going up, then that eats away at the value of money. That's why holding cash when inflation is high or if there's any inflation is not a good thing because your cash gets worth less with inflation. So your cash pays for less stuff. With inflation, let's say inflation is 5% today, like for this year. If it's 5% for this year, your money will buy 5% less next year. So your money will lose 5% in value over the next year. So that's why you need to invest to protect yourself against inflation eating away your money. 
So here, if you invested in any of these investments, so the S and P 500 ETF, exchange traded funds, long-term bonds, long-term government bonds, treasury bills, you would protect yourself against the CPI inflation here. So since all the rates of interest are higher for all of these investments on, on the left, higher than CPI inflation, that means that you're going to protect yourself to get against inflation if you invest in S&P 500, long-term bonds, long-term government bonds, treasury bills. So in this case, also another investment strategy is that if you think interest rates will go down, if you think the the Bank of Canada will lower interest rates tomorrow, bonds will go up in price. So there is a negative relationship between interest rates and bond prices. So if interest rates go down, bond prices will go up. So if you think the interest rate will go down soon, then buying a bond exchange traded fund from, like I said, Vanguard, Fidelity, iShares, Bank of Montreal, TD Bank, you would make a lot of money. So you could make that as a good trade. If you think the interest rate is going to go down, buy a bond exchange traded fund and you will likely make a good profit. So financial statements. So here there's some numbers that are very important in a financial statement that I recommend looking at when you're looking at investment. Here, these are not the best numbers here. I'll tell you why these aren't the best numbers. Because net income can be made up. So Enron used mark-to-market accounting where they just made up profits that weren't real. And they just said that this was a profit for the year because they thought that they were, they were going to get this amount of money from another company. And it wasn't actually received. So that's the problem with net income. They can just make it up in some cases. It's harder to do that now, but the the pro, another problem with net income is that some of it's not received yet. Sometimes there's there's amounts of money that the company hasn't received from their buyers yet, and they're still trying to collect it, and it still shows up on net income. So it's possible that a certain percentage of this amount of money here is not received yet. So then you still have to get that money. You're reporting it, but you still don't have it in the bank. So that's a problem because you you may need that money, right? So that becomes a problem. So that's why I don't put a lot of faith in these stats here. The, the net income stats, I don't put a lot of faith into that. So balance sheet, the things that I do put faith into are here, Cash and cash equivalents is useful because as you can see, it's increased by about 19%, 19%, 20% per year. So that's that's good. That that's actual cash that has been received, which shows that the company has cash coming in. And that's a big benefit, a big thing to show that the company has real stuff coming in. That's important. And then also, property plan and equipment is something that you can look at. It shows that the company is investing more in capital. So they've invested 9%, 8%, 9% per year in physical capital. So that's great for them. So they're, they're building more for their company. And as you can see here, accounts receivable, it's went up about like 19, 18, 25% per year. That's... This is what I was talking about with the profit. Some of the profit could be these accounts receivable and they have, that's not collected yet. So they're trying to collect on this. Those they're, they lent to people and the people haven't paid back th their loans. So, so it's possible that people don't pay back the loans. So there's a big risk there. Yeah. So that's, so there it's possible they don't even get the money back. So that, that becomes a problem. Here, this is a useful statistic here, total stockholders equity. This is the amount of equity that you have. So it's the net assets that you have for your company. So it's assets minus liabilities. So it fell during this period, likely because Apple needs a lot of, needs to take out a lot of liabilities debt to fund their operations. 
because they have to they have to borrow a lot of money to buy inventory, produce inventory, and build their company. So that's probably why they their equity went down because they took out more liability such debt. So that's that's probably that's a good reason to take out debt. So that's fine there. Yeah, so those are some statistics that you would look at here. And then the here, some more statistics you'd look at are current ratio. Usually a higher current ratio is good because current ratio shows how, so it shows if the company can pay off short-term debts pretty easily. So this current ratio in 2012 shows that they can pay off short-term debts pretty easily. So it, they don't have a problem paying off short-term debts, but here it may have a problem paying off short-term debts. So the lower it is, the more the problem they have with paying off short-term debts. But like I said, they may be taking on more debt to pay for inventory and building their company. So that might be why they're, they're taking their current ratio went down. So then the debt to equity here, it's, this is a good one here. This amount here is low. It's below 0 0.5, which is where you want it. But then it doubled in 2014. But there's probably justification for that because like I said, they need debt to grow their company by buying more inventory and building. So this is confirmed by the return on equity being over 30% per year. So 35.3%, 30%, 35.4%. 30 so that shows that my prediction, what like, so that shows that since their, their return on equity is very high, they're generating a lot of profit off of their, off of their investments. Return on equity shows the amount of, the amount of money that's coming in off of their investments. So they're generating a lot of money off of investments. So that shows that the debt's been the debt is being used to generate all that money. So that's why they're taking out so much debt because they can make so much money by investing the money from that debt. So that's that's why they're borrowing so much because they're funding more investment. So there's you... there's a few reports that I recommend. I recommend reading the 10K annual report, 10Q quarterly report, and AQ current report filing. I'd recommend reading these for any investment you want to get into because these will provide a lot of information that you'll need for investing. It shows the state of the company very accurately in terms of their financial position and their financial activities and their annual accounts. So it shows how their company is doing financially. So this is very valuable information I recommend reading. So the basic ideas of investing are to look at stocks and businesses, use market fluctuations to your advantage and seek a margin of safety. So that's what Benjamin Graham taught us 100 years from now, this will be still the cornerstones of investing. So these are some good questions to ask. And this is under uh, week, this is under week six of the PowerPoint Buffetology. So is the business simple and easy to understand? Does the business have a consistent operating history? Does the business have favorable long-term prospects? Is management rational? Is management candid with the shareholders? Does management resist the institutional imperative? So that means does management not imitate their competition? Is management trustworthy? Focus on return on equity, not earnings per share. Calculate shareholders' intrinsic value. Look for companies with high profit margins. Make sure the value added is greater than one. What is the intrinsic value of the business? Can the business be purchased at a discount to its market value? So does the company have an identifiable durable competitive advantage? Does the business have an identifiable consumer monopoly or franchise product? What is the chance the product will become obsolete in the next 20 years? So an example, is the business simple and understandable? What does that mean? Does the business make a product that's simple or complex for the average investor to understand? An example would be Seize Candy. Everyone can relate to Seize Candy, especially on special occasions. It doesn't take a lot of new technology to continue to make this product and is relatively insulated from increasing prices. Compare this to an Intel, whose products may lead to lead the market, but it does take a lot of reinvestment of capital to maintain a competitive edge. So 
something like C's Candy or Coca-Cola, you don't have to constantly be upgrading your product to compete. The product is basically the same as it was 100 years ago and today for C's Candy and Coca-Cola. So it's not, it doesn't take a lot of work to keep your competitive advantage for those companies. But with an Intel, it's a, it's a technology company that makes microchips. So they have to keep working every day to improve their product because the competitor will take their business if they don't. So, so that's why investing in a company like C's Candy or Coca-Cola, that provides you with a lot of like a lot of peace of mind because you know that the company will not be overtaken overnight by uh, another competitor because their product doesn't change that much. So these are some of the statistics that we look at. The My favorite statistic, and this is Warren Buffett's favorite statistic too, is cash flow. So the average cash flow growth here is 57.4%, which is high. You want to be looking at the five-year average cash flow growth here. And that's a very high amount. And that's a great number to look at. The second favorite is average return on equity. It's 30.7%, which is very high. That's that's a great number. Also, shareholder equity growth is good to look at. 32% per year. That's great. Um, net profit growth. Net profit, I don't really, I'm not really a big fan of, but it's it it's high at 47.3% growth per year. Sales growing at 38% per year. It's it's an okay statistic, but nothing like return, not, nothing like cash flow. Then the sales per share is growing at 40% per year, cash flow per share, 51% per year, earnings per share, 48% per year, dividends per share, 36.6% per year. So dividends are given to you as a shareholder every quarter. So every three months you get a payout from the company if the company has a dividend. So that's something that you get additional to the capital gains from the stock going up in price. So you get the stock going up in price as a, income when you sell it and then you get dividends per per quarter when you own it so capital spending per share is a good metric here this shows that they're investing more and more so that's a really good metric to look at it's going at 55 percent per year then the asset the net assets per share is book value per share that's going at 33.9 percent per year the numbers look fantastic i've never seen numbers this good for a company it's yeah so i've never seen numbers as good for any company as Apple. But then again, this is 2009, 2014. But the reason why I wouldn't buy it and I haven't is because the, I just think that the product really needs massive innovation. I think that they're, they're coming to the product ends. I think they need to come up with the next big thing because the iPhone has been around since 2007. And it's been about 17 years since the last big innovation in that. So it's been mostly incremental based on my analysis lately. So the product is just, they need to come up with a new new keystone product that they're going to provide. That's just my view. Even though the numbers are are some of the best I've ever seen, I just, I just don't believe in the product enough to buy it. But... I know some like people have different views on that, but um, as if they come up with a product that is a big jump from what they have right now, then I might consider investing. But right now I am going to hold off until seeing that. So an investor needs to do very few things right. As long as he or she avoids big mistakes, we like stocks that generate high returns and invest the capital where there's a strong likelihood that we'll continue to do so. I'll look at long-term competitive advantage, whether that's something that's in journey. Is management rational? Is management candid with shareholders? Does management resist institutional imperative? So when you have able managers with high character running businesses about which they are passionate, you can have a dozen or more reporting to you and still have time for an afternoon nap. In valuing people, you look for three qualities, integrity, intelligence, and energy. So it's very important that they have integrity. If they don't have integrity, none of those numbers matter. So if the if the CEO of Apple had no integrity and they were a liar, they were a scammer, they were a fraudster, if they were all those things, even with all those numbers that I stated and all those benefits to the company, don't invest. So integrity 
is the thing is the foundation without integrity the whole thing falls apart so even with the best numbers ever that a company has if the company doesn't have integrity like if the management doesn't have integrity the company falls apart So the institutional imperative, this is defined as the lemming-like tendency of corporate management to imitate the behavior of other managers, no matter how silly or rational that behavior may be. The institutional imperative is responsible for several serious conditions. The organization resists any change in its current direction. This work expands to fill available time. Corporate product, projects or acquisitions will materialize to soak up variable funds. Any business craving a leader, however foolish, would be quickly supported by a detailed rate of return and strategic studies prepared by its troops. The behavior of peer companies, whether they're expanding, acquiring, setting executive compensation or whatever will be mindlessly imitated. So there's some good questions here. What is the return on equity? What are the company's owner cash flows? What are the profit margins? Has the company created at least $1 of market value for every dollar retained value added? Does the company have a less than 30% debt? So ask these questions when you're, uh, when you're researching a company. These are very good questions to ask when you're researching a company here what is the business value of the company that's intrinsic value can the shares be purchased at a significant discount roughly 50 percent to its current trading price the company must have capable and vigilant leaders the company must have long-term prospects is the stock stable and understandable the company must be undervalued so you can make a good buy principle one vigilant leaders rule one low debt a debt to equity ratio of less than or equal to 0 0.5 and a debt to total assets of less than or equal to 0 0.3, high current ratio, current ratio greater than 1.5, strong and consistent return on equity, buffer requires an 8% average over a 10 year period. I, I look at, I want it at least 20% just to have a good margin and appropriate management incentives. Kind of business to invest in is one which is durable franchise product, meaning that the the business must be able to keep its competitive advantage well into the future without having to sp expend great sums of capital to maintain it. Low cost competitive advantage is important for two reasons. First, it is predictability of future earning power. Second, it improves the chance that the business can expend the shareholders' fortunes rather than having to expend capital. The business should have a franchise product. Franchise product has a durable product with a competitive advantage. That's sustainable over the long run, five to 10 years, in high demand by a large segment of the market, little or no close substitutes, little or no government regulation. Franchise product, the example used in the book is a good one. While Apple is a consistently high performer, they must stay ahead of the curve by investing in research and development, coming out with new products that may replace major products already in the market. This doesn't mean that Apple will, won't be profitable in the future. It means that there will always be more uncertainty attached to the products. Graham always told us that speculation on the future was no way to invest. A steady eighty like Coke already has a record for solid long-term success with its current franchise products. So when considering a new investment, you should be able to determine whether change in technology will have a significant effect on the demand of the product in the future. This is what establishes the long-term competitive advantage. You must be able to ascertain the feasibility of a franchise product at least 10 years in the future. When Buffett says he doesn't understand a business, he knows how it works, but he doesn't know what the future looks like. Again, it comes down to the simplicity of the business and the investing story. Mr. Buffett says that the chance of being way wrong about Coke, where he does his own shares, are probably less than being way wrong in Apple or Google. Ultimately, he says, I just don't know how to value them. So like we said before, the Google and Apple, they have to keep working hard every single day to stay out of the competition, while Coke their competitive advantage is, is solid and probably won't go away anytime soon. So this is a chart that I'm gonna show you here. If you invest $50,000 in 10% investment and hold for 20 years and never sell, it will turn into $336,375 after that period. So this is the benefit of not selling an investment here that it would turn, so $50,000, a 10% for 20 years would turn into 336,375. But then again, you got to consider here, if you think the company's falling apart, if you know that the company's falling apart based on the you reading the financials about the operations, et cetera, you, I'd recommend selling. So track that the company is still in the right state. So make sure that the company is in the right state and it's not falling apart. If it's falling apart, then sell. 
But if it's in the right state and it's not falling apart, you can keep it. So I recommend just make sure that the company is still in a good state. But if you invest $50,000 in 10% investment in sell each year, you would make $200,847. $200, so you'd make, that would still be a good return, but you'd make a lot less than about 336, 375. So you, so selling each year, you'd make a lot less. So you'd buy, you'd sell, like you'd buy it year one, sell it after year one, buy it back year two, sell it after year two, and so on. So you'd benefit a lot more if you, if you sold at the end of year 20 instead of each year. So according to Buffett, what causes risk, excessive debt? Buffett never considers a company that has a debt to total asset ratio greater than 30%. Overpaying for an investment, the price you pay for a stock should have potential for at least 50% premium. That is for every dollar you spend for an asset, you should get at least 150 in intrinsic value. Not knowing what you're doing, that is not 